I'm not trying to make a deal. I'm just trying to find it. I'm not going to create the deals. I'm just looking for one that already exists. So when I'm talking to folks, I'm very straightforward. You want to sell to me or not? If you do, this is the kind of project I take on. I'm happy to do it. But if not, I'm not going to tell you that my offer expires at 5 p.m. today. I'm not going to talk bad about your house to lower the price. I'm not going to use used car salesman tactics to corner you. I'm not going to do all that. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of A-List Conversations. I've got a massive heavy hitter in the commercial space right now. His name is Logan Fuller. And quick introduction, in the last year, he did $40 million in transaction volume and netted $5 million in commercial wholesaling. Um, he he has you know got a big inheritance, blew through it, and then built up all his net worth and after that. And so we're going to talk about his journey today. And uh, Logan, thank you for coming. How you doing? Absolutely. I appreciate the invite. Thank you so much. Yeah, we'll talk about the good, bad, and ugly, you know, all the money, no money, and then building back a great business. Yeah, yeah, that, that that's amazing. So um, you're known as the distressed property acquisition expert, right? Can you tell us a little bit about what that entails and uh, why it is profitable? Well, you know, there are a lot of ways to make money in real estate. A lot of folks like the value add. Some make money over time with rent and paying their mortgage down and getting appreciation. But for me, I wanted to make money sooner. And the only way to really do that was to buy something for less than it was worth immediately. You know, normally real estate is a slow get rich game. Normally, people make a lot of wealth in some other business and start investing it into real estate. But that's not how it worked for me. So I had to figure out how to make money quickly. And what I found is buying things for less than they were worth makes everything work. You can just turn around, list it on the market and sell it and make profit that way immediately. Um, you can rent it. And if you keep it and rent it because you bought it for a lot less than the standard rate, your return is much greater. Um, you know, there are a lot of options. Another thing that I really like, though, is it required that I use a little less capital, which is nice for getting started. And it also lowered my risk. You know, I wouldn't call myself an expert when I started. And you get into projects and you overpay for the project. It costs more to remodel than you expected. It doesn't rent for as much as you want. When you go to sell it, it doesn't sell for as much or the market changes. All these things can affect your profitability in your business. But if you're buying something for 20 to 50 cents on the dollar, none of those things affect your business. And I kind of stumbled upon that in the early days. Okay. Okay. That's great. And so what, you know, abilities and uh, talents you have now that completely help you get the deal done and, and make money from it? I think probably curiosity is the biggest one. Curiosity really is. You've got to be willing to work hard and be disciplined and all that. But if you're not curious, you're just not going to put in what it takes to figure out things that other people can. You have to go a little bit farther than them. Otherwise, you're not going to get any more than them. You Inherently, you have to be curious or you need to find something else. This ain't your deal. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's amazing. So uh, talk to us a little bit. So you you got an inheritance check. You blew it. Like what was your 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 thinking, you know, frame what, what, when you blew it and then after, you know, what, what was the, the, you know, the, the reason or the aha moment where you're like, I got to rebuild this. I can't just stay broke or, you know, <laughs> and this is the path that I want to take, you know, that I have to take. Well, Julian, I wasn't thinking that was a problem. If I had to recount to you what I was thinking, it'd be hard because I at that point in my life is mid twenties drugs, alcohol, you know, and those are problems. But when you pour an inheritance on those, that's like pouring gas on a fire. The problems get bigger and no surprise, that's what happened. So, you know, it was tough. You know, I really wish I would have inherited that money later on in life because if I inherited it now, I would be investing it and growing it. But when I inherited it then, I just blew it. You know, King Ranch truck, Porsche, new house, travel, no job, more drugs, more alcohol, downward spiral. But truthfully, the best thing that happened is I ran out of that money. You know, I was down to like 5,000 bucks. It was all I had left and I'd sold the Porsche. I kept the trucks. I needed a vehicle. I'd sold the house and moved into a buddy of mine's house. I'm literally down to five grand 
and living with my buddy, renting a room from him. Um, and that was that was a pretty you know tough time because I you're yeah. you're facing reality at that point. But I'd finally gotten sober at that point. That was the only problem that I felt like I could affect at the moment because everything else, you know, was too far gone. Uh, yeah. And I got a job in the oil field, and I just. I knew I had to go work. I knew I had to figure out how to save money. I knew I had to figure out how to stay sober. But that was the most important part in that journey. Once I did, things worked out easily. You know, Oldfield gave me some money. I started investing in some real estate. Like that changed a lot for me. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I, I'm I, I like to to hear stories that came out in a positive way. So, um, yeah, that yeah. was uh, now from oil to real estate. What kind of got your attention? What was the big aha moment? And um, now that you're full time into it, you know, what has been the reason? Well, so my mom was a realtor. Um, and I grew up around, my dad was a CPA, mom was a realtor. So I got to grow up, you know, I wouldn't say that we had a lot of money. In fact, you know, much the opposite. We were middle class. You know, sometimes we were tight on the financial side. But my dad did talk about finances a lot, although he didn't practice what he preached. I got to hear about it. Mm -hmm. um, and my mom's a realtor. So we were around, you know, we were around a lot of this stuff. And I just, I realized, look, I'm not going to get into law school. This time of my life, I ain't going to become a doctor. I ain't going to become a lawyer. I sure am not going to become an engineer. What am I going to do to make money? And you hear these stories about all these real estate people making, you know, fortunes. So I thought that was the only way I could do it. Um, yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And so, where did you get started in real estate? Was was it, uh, you know, was it single family, or did you get started a little bit more, you know, into doing bigger, bigger deals or something like that? I placed a big low risk bet. So mm -hmm. when I got busy working in the oil field, I was saving money, and after I'd blown, you know, seven figures worth of cash. I get in the oil field and work and make a hundred grand in a year. I'm like, oh my gosh, it took me 10 years to make the inheritance required. So I realized what I'm faced with, it's a lot harder to make money than I actually expected after I go through that. So I started saving, you know, I'm living there, saving at least 50% of my income, a little bit more because I'm living on the stipend they give you for living and whatnot. Yeah. So I first saving, 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 and I'm working the Texas oil fields anywhere from Midland to Laredo. So it's a crescent from South Texas to West Texas. And every, you know, couple of weeks, I'll get a little time off and I'll come into San Antonio. So it's the seventh largest city in the United States and um, one of the top four large cities in the United States, in the San Antonio. And I start to see land on the east side of town. You know, you've got your central business district, you have a highway, and then boom, all this land and all these old houses. It's in poor condition, lots of vacant lots. And I remember... When I grew up in Temple, Texas, right by Austin, I saw East Austin develop. It went from just poor town to like big money. And when I spent a little time after college living in Houston, I saw the same thing with the Heights. And I remember seeing that with San Antonio thinking, man, if the value bled across the highway at any point, like you could be in the money. And this was 2012 or 13. So I started buying a bunch of vacant lots over there with the cash I'd been saving. Yeah. You know, at this point, the lots are worth five grand, maybe 10 grand. That's it. But I, I remember thinking in Austin and Houston, the land value went way up. So if that happens, I got a shot at big time upside. But let's think about the down think about the downside. If I spent five or ten thousand for this land or you know, a, a vacant track, what's my downside risk? Is that land gonna be worth it, worth less than five thousand dollars? Probably not. You know, at this time I didn't know a lot about how what the market cycles were gonna do, but I just knew Five thousand dollars for a single family lot near downtown. If it never goes up in value, I can probably sell it to someone and get my money back out of it. So the downside exposure is very minimal, if any, but the upside opportunity could be huge. So, yeah, it made a lot of sense. So I spent everything basically I saved the last couple of years on vacant lots, picked up a couple dozen, and um, I got a call from a realtor who wanted to sell. He wanted to buy one of them for his client. And he offered me two hundred grand. And I remember thinking, wow, I'm owning this whole portfolio for 300 grand or something. And I got an offer for one lot for 200. So a couple of things happened at that moment. First off, I'm about to recapitalize from almost the whole portfolio spend. Also, I realized the market value has gone up substantially with all this off-market trading. And I just didn't know where the values were at. 
So the market had moved. And the third thing is I was no longer a poor oil field hand. I knew I was on to something. Mm, yeah. But that's what really got me into it. So yeah, yeah. I mean, that was and, and how long did it take for you to, uh, you know, from hmm. purchasing to like getting that offer to for you to realize like, wow, this is you know, I'm, I struck gold basically. So there was pure luck. I won't say I was planning. I knew this was coming. None of that. It was about twenty four to thirty six months in that period where things went from being worth five or ten grand to fifty to two hundred grand. It literally was at the very bottom of the market. And I think the market had started to trend upwards, but it hadn't quite affected us yet. That's right when I bought in. And I'm blink of an eye, and this stuff was worth substantially more. It was pure luck. I could. I even participated in it myself, and I could never go back and say, this is exactly how it happened. Here's how it's going to happen again and where that's impossible. Yeah, that is amazing. Wow. I mean, so, such a great uh, uh, result in such a short period of time. Um, well, and, and so now, you know, we, we, in the beginning, we talked about that you did $40 million in, in, um, in, in sales, you know, this last year, um, what kind of took you to there now, you know, uh, this last year and then making $5 million net. So boy, in between that, I guess, between the beginning of 2014 or 15 until now, that was almost 10 years. Yeah. You know, there were a lot of different phases. You know, when I was telling you about buying all those vacant lots, after that happened, I went back to try to buy more vacant lots on the cheap. And everybody was like, nope, we want 100 grand now. But I did find that some of the properties that I was unable to buy that had title problems still hadn't sold. And while I was going through and selling some of the lots I had, I had to fix some title problems. And my thought was, maybe I'll go back to this area and try to buy some of the property with title problems on the cheap. And that might be my way to get back in at those three year ago prices. And I found that at work. Oh. So I went back and just intentionally looked for all the big title problems and would buy those properties at extreme discounts. And then once I solved the issues, I could go sell them and, you know, get the top dollar again. So in my mind, that was millions of times better than house flipping. Um, I could use a lot lower budget. If you're spending five to 20 grand on a lot, that's cheap instead of buying a flip house for a hundred or two, like use, it requires so much less capital. Yeah. Yeah. And so what are some of these title issues that you, that the other people were encountering and that you encountered that then you, you found a, an opportunity in to make money? So I'll back, I'm going to, I'm going to go a little bit further again. Then I'll come back to that. But basically I started learning how to fix these title problems. And after that, you know, in the next several years, I guess about five years after that, I just spent time doing different types of deals, ranch deals, commercial deals, subdivisions. Um, I did some office. I did start doing some industrial uh, leasing. And I kind of went through the space of trying different deals and figured out what worked for me. But during that time, I purchased an office, um, hired folks, got an in-house attorney. Um, one of the partners is a CPA. My office got some business partners as we've grown. Um, and my office typically is anywhere from 15 to 20 head count salespeople go up and down, but you know, I usually run with 15 to 20 people and we have a really smooth operation that does this professionally. I've got an industrial portfolio that does about 65,000 a month in income. I've got a bunch of mortgage notes. We collect on those, you know, a bunch of small projects where we're buying low sell and high some, uh, we do some mobile home, mobile home parks and stuff like that. And then I've got some pretty substantial subdivisions like, large subdivisions that will be sold to the big national builders, the land development project. So it's evolved over that time into just this big, very flexible um, real estate company. Yeah. So to answer your question, um, the dirty title deals, the messy title stuff, that's what I found was the big opportunity. And I really started to dig into that because it is lower risk and you're having to use resources and you know it's a paperwork play you're gonna re you're using resources you're using paperwork uh, you're using the laws to fix problems most people can't so folks walk away from deals in the real estate business because they have problems those are the ones that i'll take i'm literally going to their trash can reaching in there picking up their trash uncrumbling it and making something out of their trash which is again a very fit very efficient thing 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's amazing. Uh, yeah, that's incredible how you were able to find some way to turn something that everybody just looks at and it's garbage, and then turn it into gold. You know, so that's right. So that's exactly great. right. And um, and so I'm I'm sure you picked up a lot of these lots, and then you you eventually sold them for what the market price was. And right, a, what when did you get into um, you know, wholesaling uh, real estate as an mm-hmm. income source. You know, that's a, a business line that a lot of people do. They're working some other job and they go see the Max Maxwells or the Cody Sperbers or Jerry Norton. You know, those are guys that you stumble across on YouTube or Instagram and you start to learn about it. Well, I didn't start that way. You know, I started buying the vacant land. I did some rent houses and started to develop that way. <clears throat> But that was never really my thing. I double closed and wholesaled a few things, but I just, I got a contract on something and realized it was worth more and sold it just inadvertently around the way. It wasn't like a model. It wasn't intentional. And I didn't really want to be part of that model because you're having to contract and resell and it's complicated because folks don't like it if they find out you're doing it. You know, sometimes you have complexities. Buyers will go around you. I didn't want to, that just sounded complicated and tough. But I met a guy who was wholesaling in Austin several years ago and was doing very well. And we had a lot of conversations over a messy deal. He brought me a messy deal we did together. And I was just super impressed with the work he was doing. And finally said, man, you're doing great, but would you like to make this bigger? Would you like to be my business partner? And we can dump some resources into this, really professionalize this and see what we can do. And he said, yeah. So that went from wholesaling duplexes and fourplexes into um, warehousing, some development land. Um, we've done some office, a ton of commercial over the next several years. Yeah. So we, we just kind of worked our way into it, I guess you could say. Not really intentionally, though. Yeah, that's amazing. And and I like what, you know, you, this, this person just happened to come into your life, you know, that you were probably helping out with some title issues, right? Yep. That does happen. On the commercial truck, you see a little less. Um, the, 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 transa- the traditional commercial transaction, you don't see a lot of title issues. Now, on a different side of this office, if you're looking for commercial with title issues and you specifically go look for them, there's a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah, and then you you uh, turn this this uh, person into your business partner. I mean, that that's, that's great. You have yep. now a, a business and <laughs> so, um, now, uh, tell, tell me a little bit about the, you know, why warehouses, you know, why, why, um, some development land, you know, um, why some office space, you know, what, why not single family? Like, you know, what, what makes that better? And why is it not talked about on from other, other people, you know, like you're, you're basically the only person I've, I've heard, you know, doing this kind of s- wholesaling so without do this kind of work you know so what is it well you ask you know why commercial why industrial the first commercial deal that i did was a 2500 square foot warehouse uh i don't even know if you can call it a warehouse it's a red iron building more like a shop is what it really was and it was on just about an acre just outside of town but it's a real busy road uh, i bought it off the delinquent tax list i paid 10 grand to the owner another 10 or 15 to the taxes I did some cleanup off the side, hauled trash off, painted it. I was in it for like, I think it was like 50 or 70 grand and it was all said and done. And I called a commercial broker and asked him what he thought I could give for it. Now, when I initially took the deal on, the appraisal district said it was valued at 250000 So I think I'm going to be in this thing for 50 or 80 and resell it and make myself, you know, 150 to 200 grand. So that's a home run in my book. Well, the commercial broker went out there and walked the site and did their valuation and said, Logan, I can get you 400000 for this. So I sold it for 430000 and I did it for like less than 70 or 80. That's amazing. And that was a big, it is, man. And what I found is, first off, at that moment, I started to learn how much demand there was for these metal buildings, especially if they're on a busy street in a good location. And what I really liked about it was it was so simple. I never actually inspected this building. It's 2,500 square foot. It's the house. It's the size of a ton of residential buildings. 
I just walk through it and picture yourself walking through a, a warehouse. You see red iron in the corners and you see some around, you know, the way you see some, uh, some joists and you see some structural up there's red iron. You can literally see it. And is it rusted or not rusted? Okay. The structure's fine. You see packs or not. And then there's usually no floor covering on it, like tile or carpet. So you can see the concrete. Do you see cracks or not? It's literally that simple. Yeah. So I just started to realize this is such a simple asset to look at, to inspect. Um, if you do any repairs, they're real easy. And concrete floors and red iron structures are very, very, very durable. So when you remodel these kind of things, dude, they're real easy. You shoot paint on them, you etch and clean out the floors, and you might put epoxy on it. Sometimes we'll do a little bit of electrical, but there's not that much work. So it was just, it was just such a simple building. And once I came to that realization and I made money, I thought, let me look at some more of these. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I think that was a smart decision. <laughs> um, so let, let's back up a little bit. Um, you, me you mentioned that you bought this property off the tax delinquent list. So just give us a breakdown of what the tax delinquent is. Why is this property on that list? Why is the seller, you know, letting this be and, uh, kind of how you were able to buy it. And, um, you know, cause I mean, I think that's a, that's a really big nugget there. So that's the most important part about this entire conversation we're going to have. And especially in that deal, everything I buy has some element of distress. You either got judgments and liens or stopping the property from being sold. You have old unreleased mortgages. You have fighting property owners. You have missing owners. You have breaks in the title chain, um, erroneous title documents of record, like bad deeds or, you know, things like that. There's some issue that a property can't sell, right? So I'm looking for that. And the, one of the first signs that you see of that is folks get so frustrated that they can't resolve it, they quit paying the taxes. So a large part of the property tax problems are associated in conjunction with delinquent taxes. And how that happens is states like Texas have high property taxes. Um, usually you'll see states with state income tax have low property taxes. And then if you have low income tax, you have high property taxes. The municipalities got to get their money somewhere. But in high income, high property tax states, these deals are much more prevalent. Where we are, we have a huge amount of delinquency for some reason. Yeah. So when a person does not pay their taxes in January 31st when they're due, they're immediately flagged as delinquent uh, on the taxes. And you can buy a list of those properties from your uh, – your county tax office yeah. costs you a couple hundred dollars for the, and they give you a list of the name of the owner, the property address, the zip code, the valuation, and how much is owed in taxes. That is my favorite list of all lists. Yeah, that is amazing. <laughs> now, now the reason why list is so important is because if those folks don't get that debt satisfied, the county is going to sell off that property to collect their taxes. So this means when a person gets behind, they've got to do something. And these folks usually are proactive. So there's a, for some reason, they're not. I don't know. There's a lot going on there. But when you can step in and pay off the taxes, possibly solve any other title issues, and do it in the time frame before this foreclosure happens or starts to happen, you can usually get a lot better deal. Yeah. So, so you bought that property from the county, right? Not from the owner. No, right. Yeah, we're a tax deed state. Some states are tax lien states. Those are different. Texas is a tax deed state. And when a, a tax lawsuit had been filed, but I don't I don't think the county had scheduled the foreclosure auction yet. Right. Well, we called this guy and said, Hey, you're delinquent on your taxes. This thing's probably gonna go to a foreclosure auction. Why don't you just sell it to us first instead? He agreed. And I actually bought this one without title insurance. We run a lot of our own um, title work in our office. And frankly, it just takes more work to close with title. We just send out a mobile notary and our attorney puts together our closing package. We do our own underwriting. And then we just zing out a closing package and wire it in the money the next day. So we can close within one to two days. Wow. 
That is amazing. And how how did you learn to do that uh, title work in office? Because that that I mean, from what I know, like the, the the standard way to do things is just do work with your title company. Hopefully, it's a investor friendly title company, and they don't mess up the deal, right? So, how, how'd you why did you get how'd you come across that? Yeah, that goes back to the curiosity thing. While I'm learning to fix these title problems, I had to learn to read deeds, legal descriptions, find out what makes a good deed, find out what makes a bad deed or an erroneous deed. And once you start kind of, I don't know, pull it on that, that string down there at the end of your shirt, you know, it kind of keeps unraveling. You start to learn about probates. You start to learn about judgments and liens. And once you really understand all that, how it works, then it's really easy to look at a title history on a property and say, this is clear. There are no claims or potential claims against it. This is good title. Even if I don't have insurance, I can still underwrite it myself and say, yep, we can buy it from him with no problems. Wow. So that was part of that process of learning how to do messy deals. I had to learn that along the way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. So, okay. And now what you do is that you pull that list consistently and then now you reach out to owners and then you work out a deal with them right and then usually those deals have a lot of profit in them because i don't know why 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 does the seller uh not uh not not do this you no know, i mean i look at both like the pawn shop of property you know these folks look if they have their business together they wouldn't be doing this they'd go solve their problems and take it to market they're not proactive they're not handle their business maybe they can't maybe they won't you know sometimes I hear people have just every excuse in the book, but a lot of them, they just, the same reason people that jump piled up in their backyard and seven cars and three weed eaters and stuff like that's the same thing. They're kind of messy. They don't care. They only handle their business. It's just a mess. And they're never going to clean that yard up. But if somebody comes over and says, let me do all this for you, well, they'll do it. But here's the kicker. They have a problem. And if they don't solve the problem, they're going to lose the property to the morg to the tax auction or the mortgage auction or whatever. If they don't fix the problem, they're going to lose it. And, you know, my pitch to them a lot of times is, look, this is headed for total loss. That's probably going to happen. Why don't you take a little bit of money from me instead of zero money from the sheriff to auction it off? And a lot of times, they're done fighting these fights. They just say, sure, I'll take your 10 grand. I'll take your 20 grand. For me, the incentive is, hey, look, I can get you that money tomorrow or the next day. I'll send it over to you quick. Um... And that's incentive enough for folks to say, I'm done with this problem. I'll let you take my problem over. Yeah. Well, now, now, when these properties, when I get these properties, though, I mean, the warehouse I was telling you about, there was $30,000 of the junk cleanup out there. Now, I got people to do it for free because they were hired off, they're hauled off metal that they could go scrap. But I'm talking 20 years with the junk pile up, or you have boundary disputes or big problems. There's real problems. You do you have to solve at the site, but that usually is not that big of a deal because you got such a good deal on it. You can go fix all this stuff. Yeah. 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 That's amazing. And another thing that I wanted to highlight um, is the, the assessed value, which is, you know, the county does a um, an assessment of what they think the property value is worth, but isn't that value always very low in comparison to actual market value? You know, it used to be in Texas, our appraisal districts have gotten really good at valuing. When I first started doing this, man, the appraisal districts would value some of those were 50 to 70 grand down at five or 10 grand. They were crazy off. Yeah. But during this last market run and with the improvement of data and uh, data sellers, and they're getting good, dude. So they can be off sometimes, you know, it happens. But I actually use the appraisal district as a value indicator. So instead of me spending a bunch of time doing an appraisal and just looking at the comps crazy detailed, I just say the appraisal districts is worth 200. I'm going to go with that number and I'm going to protect myself below it. And if it happens to be higher than that, well, then I'll get a little upside. But I just use that as an easy number. So I don't have to spend all this time vetting every deal so closely. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's good. So it's a ballpark number that you use. That, that's great. I'll try. So, yeah. Uh, so you found this deal, you, you negotiated with the sellers, you, you offer them a quick one or two day, uh, close, you know, and, and then a lot of the times they say, yes, you know, you can have the problem and you're now, you well, go. 
So that brings another point up. I'm not trying to make a deal. I'm just trying to find the deal. I'm not going to create the deals. I'm just looking for one that already exists. So when I'm talking to folks, I'm very straightforward. Do you want to sell to me or not? If you do, this is the kind of project I take on. I'm happy to do it. But if not, I'm not going to tell you that my offer expires at 5 p.m. today. I'm not going to talk bad about your house to lower the price. I'm not going to use used car salesman tactics to corner you. I'm not going to do all that. I'm just going to make you an offer that's low, so I'm protected, and I'll buy it. And if not, I won't. I'll buy a different one. Gotcha. So it's it's a very different kind of pitch, I guess you could say. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. Um, so what asset types do you now, you know, pull from those lists and, and do you, do you work with usually? They, they Real like. property. Real property. Anything. Property. Anything. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anything. As long as it's got land. You have to see what I have learned? There's no bad product, only bad pricing. Yeah. That's a really good well, I belief change. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great belief to have right there. Yeah, people tell me all the time, you know, oh, that's six acres, an hour and a half from the middle of downtown with a beat up old house on it. That's a piece of crap. It's not worth anything. And I say, I don't know that I agree with that. If I can buy it for five thousand dollars, you think I can find someone to buy it for me for sixty thousand? That's a pretty good deal to me. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and it comes down to you know just being able to accurately assess the value of these properties uh, of the of this real property. So, um, yeah. So, so how do you, how do you do that? How do you, how do you able, how do you do that for, you know, land, I guess, you know, and how do you do that for, I guess, commercial and, uh, other, you know, the commercial is a little different on the commercial. You need to look at the income model. Ultimately commercial real estate is only as valuable as the income it puts off. Yeah. As an investor. Um, so that's what you've got to use the income model many times for commercial real estate and you want to use your income model. So you know what that looks like, but you'll also use comps sometimes and you'll also use cost to recreate the replacement cost yeah. as backup numbers. Income model is your primary. When it comes to anything outside of income property, I just go to the appraisal district office web, uh, the appraisal district website for that County and say, Oh, be cat this is worth 200 grand. It's probably worth 200 grand. The reason I do that is it's simple and they do a decent enough job of it as it is. But remember, my purchase price is going to be so far below that that whether this thing is worth 150 or 250, that doesn't really mess my deal up or change it. But if you're buying with a 10% flip margin on it, like you're going to hit the nail on the head. Property's worth 200 grand. I'm buying it for like 40 grand, maybe yeah. 50. Well, I can be off by fifty grand. It doesn't matter. Great, great. And so you you go on to resolve the the issues with with the with the deeds, right? The, the title and all that, right after. Mm -hmm. And that's like the messy work, right? Right. You know, one thing, one of the most common ones that I find that I enjoy because to me they're the easiest is judgments and liens. You know, a lot of times if folks don't pay child support, they've got child support liens. Or they had a car repo, so you have a Toyota motor credit lien against the person. Or you have an old mortgage from 60 years ago that hasn't been released. Some people get sued, and there's a judgment against them, and that was been recorded as a lien in the land record. All those judgments and liens, unless they're fresh, like a year old, they can always be negotiated. Heck, even the new ones can be negotiated. Sometimes once they get beyond their statutory life, they are ineffective, but the title company still throws that on the title report. A third of those liens, I call a title company and say, this is no longer effective according to the statute. This is a 10-year lien. Please take it off the title report. And a third of them just get taken off because I know what to tell the title company. But a lot of them were done correctly, so I can have the, have the title company taking them off. They weren't indexed properly or recorded properly. Um, or I'll call the creditors and say, look, you got a hundred thousand dollar lien against Johnny boy from his failed landscape company. That was from years ago. You clearly ain't collecting it. Hey, can I buy it from you for three grand? I'll buy a hundred thousand dollar lien for $3,000. They'll sell me the lien and they'll release it. Okay. So that, that, that is amazing. So you, 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 a lot of them are, are ineffective because it's been past time from, for collection, right? Well, a third of them go. You know, you can resolve them like that. And it, two, two of them, 
you just buy them for a very cheap price of what it is and they feel happy because they got money and then you feel happy what? because you get to remove the lien and you, you bought it at a smaller price of what you would have to pay if you were going to sell the property, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. That's amazing. That's amazing. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that, that's that's incredible. And um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the way you value property. Um, the, the replacement approach and the, um, so there's, I think there's cap rate, you know, that goes with the income. Then there is um, replacement approach and then there's comp in. How, how do you do the the not so straightforward ones? Um, like, uh, you know, the replacement costs and then the comp in. Because, I mean, income is pretty easy, right? But we should go. Yeah, the income works pretty easy. You know, that's one of the challenges with commercial, the valuation. So the listing service with residential in our state, <clears throat> it records the values of the sales. And if you're going to be a member of the realtor group and get to use the listing services, you have to record the closing values. So it's nice. You can go get in the listing service and say a 2012 model house. This 3,000 square foot in this neighborhood that's similar to all the rest sells for 300 grand. This house is worth the same. It's easy. Yeah. When it comes to commercial, all those values are uh, private. Texas is a non-disclosure state, so you sellers don't have to disclose the price. And the listing service requires you to if you're going to be part of it. But on commercial, the commercial brokers don't. So the listing services, you list property out there and they're up there on the listing service, but the moment you sell it, you just delete the listing in the listing service. So that data isn't free flowing. It's not available. And that data is held with the brokers, the appraisers, the experts in the field, which is leverage for them. Yeah. So that's a challenge. So once you spend time in the business, like I am, I can tell you, you know, building on the North side of town, that it's got, you know, decent parking space and it's got, decent clear height and enough doors and all that. You can get yourself a hundred to 140 bucks a square foot, depending on some variables. I know that. And also it'll cost $95 a square foot to recreate. Um, but, but getting to that takes you a while. You really got to call brokers and butter them up. You have to do a lot of research in the land records to look at loans on properties and then work backwards and do the math based on square footage. You know, it's tough to figure it out up front. So what we did is we started building a relationship with brokers and basically told them, look, I'm buying commercial property. We're kind of new. I'm flipping some of it. I'm wholesaling some of it. If you'll help me with some of these valuations, then I'll run the deals through you. And, you know, of course, brokers are like, everybody says that. So you got to really work to like, to do that. But once you spend some time with these brokers, then it's easy. Then you call them and they, they help you immediately because you've done deals with them. Yeah. Yeah. The so that's anything you get your companion. Yeah, go, go ahead. When it comes to well, the, the cost to recreate, that's construction cost. And that's a little tougher, but, you know, that goes back to these relationships things. You know, you got to find contractors, talk to them, find appraisers, talk to them. You start to collect information about what it's going to take to get this thing rebuilt. Gotcha. So it's all about, so, so this makes it like easy for you to get the data, but it's so much harder for people to get in because the data is not accessible in the internet on, on the internet right so like so you have less competition because you have a higher barrier to entry because of the effort it takes to get all of these the this info you know this this information this data to make it um you know to make it know whether it, this is a deal or not that's right that that is amazing wow okay yeah cool cool um great so um so tell me i guess a little bit about how you talk to the sellers um i guess uh you say you don't follow like um you know a particular you know closing framework um but you probably have your own you know right so how, how do you go about to like talk to sellers you know how do you talk to sellers and then how do you uh, get uh, this to to be worked, you know, to work on on a deal. Um, you know, there are a lot of folks that have a million different renditions of how things work, and there are a lot of scripts out there. And I'm a believer of scripts. You know, I've done this long enough to where I don't really have to abide by a script anymore because I kind of have that outline in my head. Mm -hmm. um, but 
my approach is a lot less sophisticated. You know, a lot of times folks work on a very professionalized deal, like outline and wording and process. I don't do that. And for me, I found it works really well the other way. You know, I'm just, I'm this Texas guy down here who's got some real estate looking for a little bit more of it. And I'm trying to find the right deal. And it's easy for me to approach people that way. You know, if it's a problem property, which usually times it is, you know, I'm honest with them. Look, I'm doing some research in my office and we stumbled across this. You know, it looks like there might be some title issues. There might be some ownership issues. I don't know. But first off, did I even get the right person? Second off, could you help me figure some of this stuff out? And, you know, just so you know, the reason I'm interested is it might be a deal that I would might maybe want to do. It looks like deals I do. And maybe it's one that you might want to sell to me. So I don't know. If we have a conversation about it, maybe we can figure that out. <laughs> That's super it's, simple. It's not normal to be true, but you... When I started this business, I was looking for everybody's script, trying to get a checklist, figuring it all out. And that helped me learn how I should do it. But at this point, I got no frills, no, you know, bright, shiny tricks and toys. It's just fair, honest, straight to the point. That's great. And I look I, I love your tone of voice. I think it's like you're just kind of curious. You're just like, you know, yes. So some folks would say we game, but the proof is that is the truth. I'm interested. I'm curious. I'm trying to figure these things out. And I'd like them to help me. And that's exactly what I tell them. Yeah, yeah. That that's that's amazing. Pretty straightforward. You make it a collaborative effort and then you just, you know, you go through your your um your due diligence. You know, right? You're you go through the work. Um and so from from a from a usual uh, you know, from time of the first call to close. How much do you think it's like, how long does it take for that to happen? Well, in one of my business lines that does particularly distressed assets, most of what they do is land and semi-rural land, like infill and semi-rural um, sales cycle on that stuff or cash conversion cycle is about four months, 120 days from the time we start calling these folks till we negotiate, till we close, till we get it ready to sell on the market, usually about four months. Yeah. But a lot of these really messy deals could take years to get completed because there's just so many issues. Sometimes you have to go and file lawsuits. I'm usually in anywhere from 12 to 24 lawsuits, a dozen to two at a time, because there's always some curative title, quiet title or a declaration of heirship or just, you name it. Or we buy specific performance claims from people sometimes. Um, you know, there's a million things like that. So the bulk of them are done, you know, in three or four months. But yeah, a lot of them can take far longer. Wow. Okay. Okay. So that makes the the, the cycle a, little, a lot longer for sure. Um, yeah, this is a distressed acquisition. Now, if we're particularly wholesaling commercial property that doesn't have title problems, it's a wholesale deal. Those deals usually happen between 90 and 180 days. Okay. For the wholesale. Okay. Okay. That's, that's so, so, uh, three months to six months usually. Uh -huh. that, that's pretty cool. And, um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit, um, let's say you were doing, you know, commercial wholesaling, what kind of list do you pull, uh, to like target the seller that you, you would, you know, I ideally could serve the best. You know, this stuff is is really asset based. I'm looking I'm looking for warehousing in big MSAs. I don't like buying random warehouses in the middle of nowhere. That ain't happening. You want to be in a big MSA, Houston, Austin, Dallas, San Antonio. You want to be on one of the main thoroughfares, Interstate 35, Interstate 10, or usually in Texas we'll have one or two loops mm -hmm. around the city. You want to be on one of those loops. You need to be a high traffic area. So I'll pull lists that are um, looking for an a, a specific asset class in those areas. And I'm not pulling it. Uh, we do need to have some ownership probably over five to eight years usually. I like it to be over 10 years, but it depends on your area and your list. Yeah. So for example, a list that I really like is warehousing greater than 4,000 or 3,000 square foot, less than 30,000 square foot. 
um, own greater than 10 years, and then it's just going to be in certain zip codes. And there's a lot of good opportunity in those things. Ultimately, you know, you need to have, someone's got to have a fair amount of equity because you need to get some kind of deal on it. Yeah. Um, I didn't use bought it just recently. They're probably not going to be able to give you a good enough deal on it. But at the end of the day, if you're looking for an end user warehouse, you, sometimes you don't have to have an extreme discount. I'll give you an example of a, a $2 million warehouse. That could be a 15,000 square foot warehouse worth 2 million bucks. I can just get it at a 10% below value. And remember, realtors get 6%, three and three. So if I can just get it contracted at 10 or 12% below value, which isn't that much, you know, I might buy it for, I don't know, 1.6 to 1.8 contracted. Well, if I sell it for 2 million bucks, that's anywhere between two and 400,000 in profit. But they didn't give a significant discount, you know, 10% is not that big a deal. Yeah. So you can make a big spread by just scraping 10% off the top, a little bit bigger than broker fees. So when you're going to look for the commercial, or if you're going to wholesale, or you're going to be doing something like that, you don't need to have quite as big of a discount so your list gets easy. I'm just looking for warehouses in this area and this size. And if I call enough people, someone's probably going to give me a deal I want. Yeah. And, and, and it helps also to know that uh, the person you're calling, for example, in Texas, doesn't have access to any, you know, uh, way to find out what the valuation of his property is worth because the brokers have that information. And man, that's true. But the value is so subjective. You know, if you're looking at, let's say you're going to sell a warehouse to an investor, the same warehouse, an investor might only pay 1.5 million because he's got to do a little bit of tenant improvements and then he wants himself a 10% return annually. But an end user will pay $2 million because he's going to move in and use it for his business and not pay rent to anybody. He's going to pay a mortgage. Mm -hmm. So you can have radical different values based on if you're using it as an end user or you're an investor. So another thing is, even if it's going to go to an end user, but it doesn't have a tenant currently and it needs a little bit of repairs, I mean, it, a substantial value can be applied to that property because you got to pay a broker to go find a tenant. You've got to pay for tenant improvements. You got to pay carrying costs along the way. A two million dollar building that's vacant could easily be only worth one point five million if vacant, but two million with a tenant. That easy difference. So if I find somebody who's willing to sell it to me and they understand that it's worth less because it's vacant, and I can get it contracted, but then I can sell it to an end user. Well, the end user is willing to pay more. So you see an actually reasonable difference there. And I can collect the difference of those because I know where to find the two different types of sellers and buyers. Yeah. Yeah. So that's amazing. You buy from a, a seller that, you know, and then you go and put it on with a broker who finds an end buyer who who is actually going to pay more because they're going to use the property rather than you selling to an investor like yourself who's going to want like a better, you know, a discount. Huh. That, that's great. Right. And um, so it takes, you know, you said three months to six months. Um, and then how do you find these buyers? Like, is it the brokers that you develop, develop relationships with? Do they have like all the, all the, all the, the buyers, like all the people that you want? Dude, uh, probably half of the stuff that when they, it's commercial and gets wholesale, probably about half of that is getting sold through a broker. So a lot of times you're in residential wholesaling and you can't quite get the deal you're looking for because you're talking to a seller and they say, oh, I'm going to call a broker or an agent. What's the first thing you do? You're like, crap, my deal's about to get bombed. Yeah. Because the realtor, hip uh, them to pricing, it's going to change and it's falling apart. In this case, when you get a broker involved, it's different, man. The brokers are trying to get paid. And if someone wants to cut their own deal with a different pricing, the brokers don't care as much. Transactions can take one to two years in the commercial world. And if you've got a seller who wants to sell, the buyer who wants to buy, and that buyer's and that broker's going to get paid in a couple of months, believe me, they're going to facilitate that deal to get done. And they would much rather get a $45,000 commission in four months instead of a $60,000 commission in two years. Believe me, they're helping get it done. So we do all on brokers. Another neat thing is, Brokers have these long lists of clients that are looking for properties. Like they're ready to go. They've been vetted. They know what they want. And you can count if a broker brings a buyer, they're ready and serious. So 
before we start looking for buyers, we call a bunch of brokers we know and let them know what we have. I bet somewhere between a third and a half the time, that's how things sell. That that's amazing. So so you contact the seller, right? Because because you're getting these uh, these properties, you know, direct to owner, and then you know if a sell if, if a if a broker gets involved, then it's, it doesn't kill the deal because they want to get the deal done, and you know. And, and then they also help out in the disposition side with like they they sell it to an, an end user, you know, and so you're you're golden there. That's right, yeah, that's right. Cool, cool, cool. Um, that is, in, and so how do you? I guess a big of this this uh, this job, you know, is to talk to brokers. You know, how is this some you know that. How, how do you talk to them so you can butter them up? How do you get them to like trust you? How do you get them to to work with you, you know, and 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 not kill your deal? You know, being credible or sounding credible has a lot to do with that. You know, the way they perceive you really matters. Yeah. When you figure out what kind of words to use, the the type of lingo and jargon to use in these type of deals and the concepts, you know, you start to sound a lot more credible and reasonable, but a lot of that is negotiating. You know, if you're in a somewhat of a sales role and you've got to make somebody like you, you got to work with them and get them to trust you, you know, that's the exact same concept that you're going to get here. So, but ultimately, if you're, if you're not delivering, folks are going to stop working with you. So when you're calling brokers to help get valuation because you're inking deals and they say that they have buyers that are going to match up more what you're getting, then that's great. You bring those deals right to them. Uh, but if you start to run a situation where you're always calling them looking for valuation and help and telling them something's coming and you're never really bringing stuff to them, they're going to get to a point where they quit answering your calls. So building those relationships over time really is the backbone of that part of the job. Gotcha. Uh, let me ask you something, uh, which, which I, I know the answer to, um, it, it is, how do you focus on the right brokers? Like, so that, you know, you're working with someone that has, you know, a long list of buyers and also like a lot of experience, um, so that, you know, because it, it would suck if you started a, a relationship with the broker. And then he, he wasn't of much value or didn't have as much buyers in his list. Right. So what, what, what kind of, uh, you know, how do you prioritize, I guess? Well, I'll tell you the big firms usually have the better brokers. You know, when you're looking, you'll see like the JLLs at the world, like those big commercial brokerages, um, uh, uh, the listing service, I always forget what they're called. LoopNet and CoStar and Crexie or whatever. Yeah. You can go on to that, and even if you don't have a membership, you can look at all these listings out there. Just click through the listings and look at who the listing brokers are. It can take you 15 minutes to put together a list of half a dozen brokers. But if you're looking at the big firms, the big national firms, you're going to start to see people's names pop up over and over and over. And you realize those are the guys, you know, they're doing this business for a long time. There are a lot of listings out there. That's who you start calling. Now, sometimes you might get to the big dogs that are doing these, you know, half a million square foot industrial projects or like big stuff. And they aren't going to want to fool with this small stuff, but they'll refer you to a broker in their office or one of their team members or assistants or something. And you'll wind up in the right spot. But um, yeah, call one of these small brokers and just some random itsy bitsy little team. You probably don't want that because that's that's what you're dealing with, basically. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, well, I will tell you that the, the commercial brokerage world is far more sophisticated on average than the residential. If you're going to reach out there and just put your arms around 20 residential bro um, agents or brokers, you have a, you can easily have a, low, a lot of low quality in there. But if you reach out and put your hands around 20 commercial brokers, the odds are you're going to get a much more sophisticated experience, higher quality of professional, because commercial is longer, harder, folks are in it longer. It just takes a different quality of person to make it in that world. And you'll see that when you're reaching it, when you're dealing with these brokers. Okay. Gotcha. And do these brokers also give you deals? Not really, man. I'm, I've not been in a spot where that happens. You know, brokers prospect, they do their own stuff. And at the end of the day, 
they want to take something to the market or they want to bring it to one of their clients. But, you know, sometimes you'll see it, but it's rare that you see a broker get something that's mega discounted. You know, if, if you do, all of these commercial brokers are hooked in with investors and friends and they know people that do this. So unless you're a really close colleague with a broker, like I, there's a couple of people I know that will get a call and the broker will say, look, let me just refer you over to a broker, a group that I work with that we would buy and the broker can still be the buyer. So he would refer it in and the broker would say, look, I want to be partners with y'all in the year because I brought this deal. And it's a smoking deal. And we would just buy it instead of him going to list, we just buy it. And then you could go list it, you know, after you're ready. Some brokers will funnel you a deal like that, but you got to be real close to a man. And a lot of times they just want to go to market. So it's tougher. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, and so what you, you said that you have a team of 15 to 20 people, um, have, uh, other people have been able to get results, um, doing this, um, this new opportunity, like this new model of, uh. Of wholesaling you know you know i don't know a ton of people doing it mm -hmm. um every once in a while i hear about i heard the other day about a shop out in phoenix doing it there's another group out of florida i heard about that was doing it but i don't hear a ton of people doing it you know i've done some workshops um and folks have been able to refer some great deals that we've jv'd with them um like that it's also helped educate folks for their own business as they grow so you see people easing into it, but it takes a lot more work and time. It's a far more sophisticated model. So you, you don't see it as, as widespread as residential wholesaling because you can truly residentially wholesale with almost zero dollars. Mm -hmm. And in commercial, you got to build relationships. You got to have money for earnest. Let me ask you this. How much you putting down on your residential wholesaling deals for earnest money? Uh, five to 10,000. And that's on your residential deal? That's on the high side. Okay, that's very unique. Yeah, I mean, it, no, usually you put 1%. Yeah. Well, in residential wholesales, what I see is around here in Texas, 90% of people are giving them 100 bucks. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Earnest money. Yeah, you're, you're, you're totally right. Yeah. I ask for, you know, five or $10,000, right, from my buyers. I personally. Oh, wow. I'm yeah. doing the other way. I'm talking about from the seller. Yeah. So that's another big barrier to entry. When you're dealing with sellers, most people that are wholesaling residential put down 10 bucks, 100 yeah. bucks for earnest money. Yeah. Well, in commercial, you call Mr. Epstein in his 30,000 square foot office that he's going to try to sell to you for two and a half million bucks and you want to give him 100 bucks in earnest money. Dude, you don't even know what his response is because as soon as you say that, he hangs up and it's over with. Yeah. You will put down 1% at least. And 1% of two and a half million is 25 grand. So the dollars do add up. So the barriers are greater to get into this. Now, have I seen some folks get into it and just do absolutely incredible deals? Yeah, but you know, it's a little different than the residential. So a transition can look different. I normally encourage folks if they're looking at making a change, I encourage them to look at more distressed deals than I would say look at commercial because you can take a couple hundred thousand dollar residential deal. It's got a lot of problems. And still make 50 to 100 grand on it simply. It's a lot easier to make the money on a distressed residential deal than it is convert into commercial wholesaling. Yeah. And and I guess uh, the, the big important part here to touch on a little bit more is kind of those uh, tax delinquent reasons. Um, how does how does one go about like learning what those are and how to deal with them? Um, just like you did, you know, in your uh well, I think the workshops here and there, I mean, I learned the hard way. I had to learn myself in the street, cutting deals, or in the trenches, cutting deals, figuring out, paying lawyers to teach me, learning the hard way, making mistakes. You know, you'll see folks that do workshops. I do, I'm doing a workshop April 6th in Dallas Fort Worth. It's like 500 bucks for an eight hour day. Yeah. I go over the entire business model. I workshop like every single step of the way, how to find these deals, what they look like, how to negotiate them, like the whole shebang. Yeah. So there's a lot of that kind of out there. Get yourself a little education on it. And then you have to get out there and start trying. <laughs> that's how that's how you learn a lot of those next steps. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And now uh, would you uh make that recording available for other uh users, other people? For that workshop? Yeah. 
I do have that. So there's a couple options. You can attend in person, mm -hmm. but if you don't attend in person, you can also watch it virtually, like live from your home or anywhere that has an internet connection. And if you want to watch it but can't make it that day, I also have that same virtual ticket is open for the entire month. So you can watch it any time within the next month. The ticket price is about the same. Okay, cool. Yeah, because we could offer that for the group, you know, if anybody wants to learn uh, some of the tax delinquent uh, uh, methods to to success. So, so that's great. Um, so I guess we'll wrap up. So real, real quick, you know, like what have you been able to do um, with, you know, this new model of doing real estate uh, so that people kind of see your your result and can decide for themselves, like they can see for themselves whether they want to be like you and have the same results. They have the same results. You know, at the end of the day, folks are looking for a change or trying to make more money. Either their business is going good and they want to grow it or it's not going good and they want to figure out how to do better. It's an easy answer. I ask people, but go out there and follow me on Instagram. My name is Logan Fulmer. You know, I post about the deals I do every couple of days. I do case studies. I'm always showing them. I'm talking about the numbers in and out all the way. I encourage folks to go take a look and see what it looks like. You know, if you're going to go flip a house and spend 175000 to go resell for two twenty five, dollars and after fees make yourself $40,000, why don't you consider using that 40000 to buy a $200,000 house and fix some paperwork problems? And then you go resell for two hundred, and you only end up for forty. You switch it. Instead of making a $40,000 $40, profit, you buy the property for $40,000 and make a $200,000 profit. It ain't rocket science, man. It just requires a little bit of time and attention. You got to change your focus, but your risk goes down. The amount of capital required to do these deals goes down substantially, and your margin goes through the roof. So I, people can look for any other reasons to not do it. I can't figure any of them out. I mean, unless you're building skyscrapers and deploying 50 million bucks at a time, but you know, if that's what you're doing, you're in other circles. You're not looking for this. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so, um, let's, uh, you know, how many deals are you looking to do this, these next like, uh, six to 12 months, I guess, or, the, or, or, or calendar year? You know, annually, I'll do anywhere between one to 200 transactions. It's kind of shook out that way. I don't know that I necessarily have any interest in doing more volume. I've found out how to optimize those deals. And some of the deal sizes have grown. You know, I've got a 250 house subdivision I'm entitling right now. You know, that's about a somewhere between 20 and $28 million sale for the entitled land. Mm -hmm. Got another several hundred unit that's uh, that's a $10 million sale. So the, some of that land development stuff helps really grow the dollar amount without having to increase the volume. So that, that's kind of the approach that I take. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Oh, that That's right. Okay, cool. Well, um, thank you. Uh, can you spell out your, your Instagram and, um, you know, give us your website information and and uh, just so we, we have more um, more ways to, to connect with you, to, to contact you? Absolutely. Logan Fulmer. It's L-O-G-A-N. Last name is F-U-L, F as in Frank, U-L-L, M as in Mary, E-R. If you plug that in Instagram, I'm the only dude that shows up. What I would tell you to do is right now we're about a month away from April 6th, which is when I do, I'm doing an event in Dallas. It's about distressed property acquisition. It's the entire day workshop. I'll send you the link. I'd encourage you to include that when you post this stuff. At yeah. the end of the day, it costs the same as you'd spend on a Saturday night out drinking with your buddies or a pair of Air Jordan shoes, 500 bucks. But what you get is the entire roadmap of what we're doing. I've got recorded seller calls we're going to listen to to find out how to negotiate these deals, case studies. We go through skimming leads ourselves and researching them in the group. I mean, it's an awesome day. I can get about 200 people into that event hall. Um, I've never done this one before, but this is the first year I'm going to do it like this, but I'm really excited about it. It's a great time. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. And for people to be, uh, for people to be clear, um, this, uh, information can be for residential and commercial, right? Like the yep. tax delinquent, uh, uh, you know, yep. okay, cool. So you guys that are both in the residential and commercial, you guys can go check it out. Um, I will link it into, in the podcast uh, episode below. So uh, yeah. So thank you, Logan. I really appreciate it. Uh, hope to have you on in the future. And 
for everybody else listening, um, Logan, what, what would be your, your parting words? You know, I would tell yourself, I would tell you to remember that you're capable of a heck of a lot more than you actually think you are. You know, I started this business almost 10 years ago, just doing these little piddly vacant lots downtown. And today it's an office full of people, a big portfolio, and it's a real operation. And I don't know that I'm smarter than half the people out there listening to this. I just was very curious, kept working hard and took one, put one foot in front of the other, one step at a time, every single day. Things compound, you know, and over 10 years it gets big. So I'd encourage you to take on that elephant, you know, be the, you know, be that guy who tries to take a run at something that's far bigger than you are or that you think you are. And you'd be surprised how quickly you can get there. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. All right. Great, Logan. Thank you. And, uh, uh, hope to see you soon. Absolutely. Thanks, Julian. Bye.